Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Gary Matsuoka, and we're here at Laguna Hills Nursery in Santa Ana on a Saturday morning, and today's class is growing tomatoes. So just so you know, tomatoes are about the easiest plant in the world to grow. They'll grow under really bad conditions. We do have to follow some rules, though, to get the best results. So most people grow them in the ground. And if you grow them in the ground, you do have to follow crop rotation. So crop rotation means that if you grow a tomato plant there one year, don't try not to plant it in the same spot for two or three more years. Now, if you do, you'll have decent success the second year, but then it really messes you up for the following three or four years. So if you can rotate properly. Now, a friend of mine runs a farm in Irvine. He has leases land throughout Orange County, they, they're on a 10 crop rotation, which takes about three or four years for them to go through 10 different crops before they get back to tomatoes or something related. So tomatoes are related to peppers, eggplant, potatoes. Um, so if you grow, let's say in the summer, uh, tomatoes and peppers, put them in the same bed so that you can move them to a different bed the next year without running across rem remnants of those plants. So tomatoes, eggplants, peppers are your summer crops. Uh, potato is more of a spring crop. So, and tomatillos are related to them also. So uh, now what happens, because this was like 30 years ago, I wanted to see what would happen if I grew tomatoes in the same spot every year, every year, every year. The first time you put them in the ground, even in terrible soil, they do wonderful. You get this huge plant, uh, hundreds of fruit, if it's a cherry, or you know, dozens if it's a larger type. And then I pulled it out, planted the same plant the next year, and it was about 80% as good as the first. Not bad. <clears throat> and then the third year we did it again, and the plants just turned yellow and rotted away. Uh, and then we just left that and said, okay, that's not good for another three years. But, um, but we do have customers, you know, who tell me that's all they grow is tomatoes. <laughs> so what do they do? Um, so you might have to take a year off or two off and put them in pots. Uh, you can even just open up a bag of potting soil and grow it in a, a freestanding bag of potting soil. So, um, so it's good to rotate the crops. Now, we have really good potting soil, or top pot, or acid mix will grow tomatoes just fine, either in pots or in the ground. Uh, most potting soils will grow a tomato not quite as well as they will in ours, but we know tomatoes, can, you know, tomatoes are about the only plant in the world that grow in a pile of compost. Compost is there to digest any type of plant material, and tomatoes can handle that. And most potting soils on the market are compost piles, essentially. Lots of nutrition, but a lot of bacteria and fungi that are trying to eat up that stuff. And tomatoes will tolerate that pretty well, too. Uh, now, you know, if you're, if you're losing your roots because it's in the wrong soil, because there are some really bad potting soils out there, then generally your plant just starts turning yellow from the bottom up. So you can tell that is having root problems if it, if it turns yellow from the bottom up. Now, there are a lot of other problems with tomatoes, too. There's plenty of tomato diseases that most people eventually run into, but it usually can get a good crop in before you see them. So that's one of the strategies that the universities are telling the farmers, you know, when you grow tomatoes, you know, let's say, you know, 10, 15, 20 acres of tomatoes, don't try to grow it as a long-term crop. Grow it as a short-term crop, get the fruit off of there, and then, you know, because most uh, tomato plants eventually get diseased, especially if you're growing an acre of them, several acres of them, they usually get diseases. And this is a, a book that University of California has produced on just the types of tomato diseases. And you go through here, you look at every single one of these things. I mean, there, there's about 30 or 40 t diseases listed. And these aren't 
the really bad ones either. There's some a lot of new ones that came out in the last 10 years that are incurable. So do be careful on, well, you know, be careful. Just know that they're out there and that your tomato plants, when they get, you know, after three or four months, because they can live for several years if the winter's not frosty, just know that the longer they're there, the better the chance they have of picking up a disease. So, and usually the diseases are due to, well, the common diseases we get this time of year are due to rain. So, it's not, and so when you get the leaves wet, it's not a big deal. But if the drop of water sits on the plant for more than four or five hours, that's when a, a, a disease spore can germinate and attack that leaf inside that drop of water. So if you just sprinkle your plants every morning and they dry off in a few hours, no problem. It doesn't really cause diseases. In fact, you know, rinsing the plants off in the morning, getting the dew off them, often helps. Because um, that droplet has been sitting, that droplet of dew has been sitting there for a while, and if it stays there till noon, undisturbed, then that disease can attack it through that droplet of water. But if you were to flush off the dew in the morning, that gets rid of the spores that were in that droplet of water trying to get into the leaf, and then you know, more spores will have to find that droplet of water. But that droplet will maybe dry before they have a chance. So that's the key. Now, if we have misty weather, like we did last year, you know, you can be in real big trouble. It just stays wet all day long and all night long. So try not to water in the evening. That's when the water will just sit there for hours and hours and hours. Water in the morning, and best time is when the sun's out, so it'll dry off quickly. Now, when plants are young, and you only have one plant in your yard, and it's getting wet, not as big a deal. It's so open at this point. There's so much air space around it that it dries off pretty fast. And once tomato plants you know, get a huge amount of foliage, it's harder for them to dry off. So we often get disease when they get bigger, unless you train it a certain way so it stays nice and open. So now if you do, you know, if you do grow these right now and it starts raining and we get the weather we had two weeks ago, which was really nasty where it's you know, raining for four or five days on end, you can pick up diseases. Now, a lot of them will start on the lower foliage as spots. In fact, I, I found one in the nursery this morning that has a few little tiny spots on this particular end of this leaf. I don't know if you can see that. With little brown spots on the end of the leaf. So let's say it could be a fungus spot, it could be bacterial. It's really hard to tell the difference when you look through the disease book which one it is. But you can cure the plant at this point by just picking this off and throwing it away, get it out of the area so that it can. So these spots are a source of disease to infect the other plants. You just pick them off and throw them out, then your chance of getting spreading the disease are, are lower. So it's nice to get rid of those. Now, the grower said that, that works for a lot for most diseases that they can pick up. However, if you get a black spot forming at the bottom of the stem, that's pretty much done for. So if you get a disease attacking the base of your plant from water, then you might as well take that one out. It's it's going to kill the plant. But generally, most of them affect the leaves first. And you have plenty of, you know, if you take a look at your plants now and then you'll find those, pick them off, and you'll be clean of diseases. We'd rather not spray for diseases. I mean, we're not, you know, if you garden your own plants, uh, have your own garden, then that's, you're trying to avoid using chemicals at all costs. So there are fungicides that will control a lot of the common diseases, but there are no cures for some of the new disease that came in. So the new ones are bacterial infections, which are spread by bugs. So there are several bugs. Uh, some are new to us. Some are old timers that fly around and suck on other plants and come tomatoes and suck on it. And there are diseases that will just cut off the circulation right where they suck. So we've seen it over the years where you have a nice, beautiful 
six foot tomato plant and suddenly one of the stems just dries up and, and you know, the rest of the plant looks great and one stem dries up. That's a bacterial infection when you get that. And they said um, it really hit Mexico, Baja, uh, San Diego County about 10 years ago. They had a really bad outbreak of some kind of bacterial infection. Uh, and they told the farmers in San Diego, especially along the coast there, uh, the only way they can grow tomatoes is if they put a um, systemic pesticide in the ground before they started their crop. It was so bad. They were losing about, I think they said 60% of their crop was dead, dying. And down, they said down in Baja was like 80%. But in theory, the systemic insecticides will not go into the fruit, but I'm just not a fan of them. <laughs> I just don't want to use something like that around edibles. If you do put a systemic in the ground, you couldn't grow uh, vegetables, the leaf crops there for a long time, which, you know, so you don't want to really do that part. Okay. Um, as far as fertilizers go, they're, they're not that picky. They need something. So, uh, you know, if you're gardening in the ground, uh, just a general purpose fertilizer like this bile fish, this vegetable garden, organics usually work better in the long haul. Now, if you're growing in a pot, sometimes the organics will take a month to kick in, especially during cool weather. You might want to just get them started with a chemical release that starts right away. Uh, and then finish off with the organics. We like organics better, but they do have a hard time starting in potting soil because nature's not there yet. It takes a while for nature to show up and start making them work. This stuff actually will last long enough to take them through their entire crop, but the organics are better. You can put them in at the same time. Have both available. Now, there's different ways to grow tomatoes. Most people opt out for a tomato cage. Now, this is a really expensive, this is like the most expensive tomato cage you can get. It's nice because it's, the metal is thicker. Uh, it's, you can fold it up. It does fold up. Uh, let's see if I can figure out how this one folds. Well, maybe I can't figure it out. <laughs> it does, it does fold up, so to take up less storage space, and it should last you five, six years or more. We don't have, we ordered our less expensive tomato cages, but a lot of the manufacturers don't manufacture just for California. They do for the whole country, and generally they don't start making them until, or don't have them ready to sell until spring. So we'll get our less expensive tomato, these are from last year, our less expensive tomato cages should be in here soon, which are much thinner metal, tend to last this one crop. So they run, you know, five to eight dollars. This one is like a seventy-eight dollar thing. So they're really pricey. Now you don't have to use the cages at all. Uh, if you want, you just let your tomatoes sprawl on the ground. Of course it takes up more room that way. Um, a lot of farms just let them sprawl on the field. So that's another way to do it. Um, when you let them sprawl, they get a little bit more rotting of the fruit. But when you cage them up or you stake them up, they get a little more sunburning of the fruit. So it's a trade-off. So, and, and on the ground, they're a little more subject to animal attack from snails and slugs also. But even if you stake them up, they still can get attacked by a lot of critters. So... <clears throat> Now, generally in the spring, we don't see too many bugs, but once you get to July, um, the real famous tomato hornworm shows up. Now, the true name of this that we get on the West Coast is uh, Carolina Sphinx Moth. The true tomato hornworm is east of the Rockies, and the Carolina Sphinx, which looks just about identical to it, is west of the Rockies. So we get the Carolina Sphinx, but 
they have the caterpillars that grow three to four inches long. So if you're squeamish, you may not even want to grow tomatoes, but there are some organic controls. So if you don't like hand picking or cutting them in half with pruners, um, there are some organic sprays that do a good job on them, and those are these two that contain a, a chemical called spinosad, which is organic. Now, we don't carry what is called BT. Um, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a caterpillar disease. We like spinosad better for a couple of reasons. BT has a shelf life. If we don't sell it in three months, throw it away. It is a disease that they make every year a new batch. Um, the way they make BT or bacillus thuringiensis is kind of... <laughs> well, what they do is they get a whole bunch of caterpillars and infect them with this disease. And when they're all sick and full of this disease, they freeze dry them, grind them up, and throw them in the bottle or the shaker can. So you have freeze-dried uh, caterpillar parts that are totally diseased, and you spread that around your garden. It can disease... Uh, any caterpillar out there for that year. So they have to make a new batch, fresh batch every year uh, with the, uh, you know, so it's like COVID-19 is now four generations, five generations down the road. This thing, they make a new generation of it every year to put it out. The other problem with BT is it's only effective for about four or five hours in sunlight. So you have to reapply it at least once a month or more to so the the hornworms the first week of their life they're maybe that big i mean they're 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 just really tiny so they can only eat like parts of one leaf the second week of their life they can maybe eat the entire leaf the third week of their life that's when they can really start doing damage where, where they'll eat a whole branch at a time um so their life cycle on the plant is four weeks on the plant uh, two weeks as a pupa underground in the summertime, and then they catch back out. The big giant moths that fly around and lay eggs at dusk. Um, so it's a, like a six-week cycle. They can have three or four generations per year. But we don't usually see them until July. Unless it's really, really hot in June, they don't usually come out until July. I used to raise caterpillars when I was a kid, so I know this stuff really well. Um, the way BT, we don't sell it because it's got issues. Spinosad will last two weeks on the plant. Um, it is a chemical found in, it was found, created by bacteria in rum distilleries. So they consider that most people have already drank some form of spinosad. Uh, it does kill any chewing insects, so not only does it kill, the BT only kills caterpillars, spinosad will kill green grasshoppers, not the brown ones. They'll kill beetles, they'll kill pill bugs. Uh, they won't kill snails, unfortunately, but they'll kill a lot of critters that uh, attack the tomato plant. Don't know, don't know the, haven't tried it. <laughs> now, last year we did get mildew going on, and, uh, and well, the other thing you get is, the other really nasty bug that tomatoes get is spider mites. Uh, spider mites are actually true spiders. Now, most spiders in nature, they'll inject their toxin to a bug, which liquefies the inside of it, and they'll suck it out. That's how they feed. Little spider mites will inject a toxin into one cell of the leaf at a time, liquefy that cell, and suck it out. So they feed on plants instead of insects. So if your tomato plant looks like the leaves are going from green to gray, and you see little spider webs on them, uh, they turn gray because... The spider mites are sucking out the green of, you know, most of the cells on the leaf are missing their greenness. So, uh, 
they start looking gray and then they get this and they'll shut it down i mean spider mites will make that plant so sick um, that they just stop production now usually spider mites run their course if you don't do anything in about a month they will be gone because there are other predator mites that will find that colony of spider mites and kill them but you can kill them really quickly with an oil spray we have several neem oil which is expensive mineral oil which is cheap these just cover them with oil they can't breathe for 10 15 minutes they die the oil evaporates especially if you, know, you have to do this on a warm dry day like today is not bad um, because the oil has got to evaporate within a day or else the plant suffocates too. The leaves need to breathe air also. So if you do it during a warm, dry day, uh, you're fine on that. Now in the old days, we didn't have these oils. What we would do is just blast them with water. If you get a hose with a good nozzle in it, blast them from underneath. There's, you know, there's not only the spider mites, they lay eggs. All over the place you'd have to try to blast them off and then do it two weeks in a row because those some eggs will hatch out the next week you can't it's hard to get those off the leaves and then you can cure it that way too i think that's most of the bugs um Yeah, that's most of the serious bugs. Now, they do require, uh, well, I'm not sure if you have to pollinate, because they are self-pollinating. I don't know if they have to have bee activity on them or not. When they don't need bee activity, that means you can cover the whole plant with netting if you want to keep all the bugs out. Uh, we'll try to get some netting. There's, there's these bags they make to cover entire fruit trees now. Some bags are six foot, some bags are eight foot tall. You can cover your entire small fruit tree with this bag that keeps all the insects out, lets the light in. We know if the plant requires pollination by bees, you can't do that at that point. So, uh, but tomatoes, I, I believe they are self-pollinating, which, you know, their flowers hang And the pollen just, when the male stamens just falls on the female part and it gets pollinated. So I don't think they require bees, but I'll have to look that up a little more. Now there's, just so you know, there's two kinds of tomato plants. Um, well, actually there's several different categories. So one would be hybrids versus heirloom. And the other is determinant and indeterminant. So most tomatoes were originally hybrids. And there's a lot of them that are now heirlooms. The different thing, uh, hybrids are when you take two distinct tomatoes, like when they made grape tomatoes, they took a cherry tomato variety and crossed it with the Roma tomato, which is a paste tomato, and they got a grape tomato. So when you have two different parents and what they do to make sure they have the right parents they'll take that the flower they want to make it make a fruit and seeds they'll pick off all the male stamen pollen parts before they mature and produce pollen and they'll take the pollen from the other plant and put it on that female part and then we, they know that they've got two different genetics in there so tomatoes have are like us they're uh diploid which means they got two sets of genes so you take genes from two totally different tomatoes and combine them together you get 
a hybrid. So the original grape tomato is a hybrid. Now to get an heirloom out of this grape tomato, you take the seeds out of this grape tomato. Um, in theory, if you use genetic, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, well, you know how genetics works. If you take the seeds out of this, half of them will resemble that. One, one quarter will resemble that, one quarter will resemble that. The way Mendel's genetics work when you have a diploid plant. So you have to do this, they say at least seven times, take the seeds out of this. You take the ones that look like this and, and grow them further, take the seeds from them. And then you throw away the ones that look like the parents. And you do that for seven generations. And by that time, you've got an heirloom. <laughs> so heirlooms, most of them have been around 50 years or more. But they keep on throwing away the ones that don't look right and keep the ones that they want. And eventually, that hybrid becomes an heirloom. So there's, there's no laboratory involved. So there are all, they, they have made a few over the years GMO tomatoes, which are genetically modified, where they put a weird, weird gene that doesn't belong to tomatoes into that plant. But we don't know of any that are occurring at the moment because the ones that they made, they made them over 20 years ago, didn't sell. So they just gave up. They said there's too many other good tomatoes around. They don't have to make these GMO ones. What they did is they made a, a tomato plant back in the 90s that went over ripen. So you can sit it on your table for a month and it still was the same. It didn't have the genetics in it that made the thing continue to ripen until it rotted, <laughs> which is kind of weird. So anyway, um, heirlooms are just, so what you can see on hybrids is the genes in a hybrid tomato, they have two different sets of chromosomes. An heirloom, they're, the two chromosomes that they have are the same. They've eliminated all the, the, weir, the, the, the parents' chromosomes and just kept the uh, hybrid chromosomes. So, right, right, because there's no genetic variability among the genes in this anymore. In theory, if if the the breeder was doing a good job these will breed fairly true. Now, again, we call these varieties because every seed is genetically not quite the same as the other one. Every seed is still unique, but basically if you have a hybrid with the same two parents, you're going to get offspring that are pretty much the same. And if you have heirloom seeds, the offspring of that will be pretty much the same also. So. Well, they all had to start as a hybrid. Uh, if, if someone discovers something really, really good that's different than anything else that was there before, it had to be a hybrid. There, it couldn't be, well, it's not. So occasionally you'll have a, a, a chromosome get hit by a cosmic ray and change it so that there's a mutation. And that happens. I mean, there's different colored tomatoes that are the same, but except for colors. Sometimes those are just chance mutations that happen from radiation from somewhere. You know, there's, there's a lot of background radiation in, in our uh, thing that can cause minute changes like that. So Now, uh, there are sometimes you'll get tomatoes that have the same name, and one's a hybrid and one's an heirloom. So we notice that now on this table, I've got the hybrids on this side, the heirlooms on this side. One of the famous tomatoes called Momotaro, which has been our best seller the last 15, 20 years, is a hybrid. But now and then we'll, from, we'll get from the uh, one that says Momotaro heirloom on it, which means that now the reason why they do that is because when you do this crossing, and you have to do it in a, in a greenhouse laboratory setup, 
so there's no pollen coming from the wrong source. These seeds, retail-wise, can be 30, 40, 50 cents each. Whereas seeds for heirlooms may be penny, one or two cents. So these cost a lot more for the growers to get. Literally cost them at least a quarter a seed, which is a lot of their profit, and those are like pennies a seed. So a lot of times they'll take the, the hybrids and keep breeding them with themselves or just take the seeds off of them and eliminate the ones and then create an heirloom version of it. What we have found, though, is that some of the heirloom versions of this plant do not taste the same. Whereas if they're the original hybrid, because the grower uh, who does the hybrids, they can keep the exact two plants they crossed almost forever. In other words, you can keep one tomato plant going for decades and decades. If you take cuttings of it, root that cutting, it's genetically identical. Because tomato plants, you know, you, you take the top of this, uh, take a piece of stem of the tomato plant off, stick in water, darn thing makes roots. You can just keep it going for a long, long period of time, the same exact plant, and you take the two parents, you keep them exactly the same genetics and keep crossing them, you get pretty much a very similar hybrid for a long, long time, whereas heirlooms can drift. So we noticed that some of the heirloom versions of this just, didn't know, just do not taste quite the same as the original plant. So heirlooms, you know, they, they can change because they're, they're, they're not genetically perfectly stable. So, plus they, they have fewer genes in them. This has got two totally different sets of genes and most of these have two sets of the same gene. So not only are they, they, they can be a little different, but they can also be weaker you know, when you have two totally sets, different sets of genes, you do generally have more vigor and more disease resistance than if you just have one set of genes. Now, the, a lot of these plants were, are bred for a particular climate. Like we know the one called Mortgage Lifter was developed for, I think it was uh, Virginia. So it's perfect in that climate. It may not be perfect in our climate because we have a totally different climate than they do. So, so that's hybrid versus heirloom. Um, heirlooms tend to be a little more distinctive because they're they just got bred for a certain trait. So it could be really good flavor. It could be a spectacular appearance. It's harder for to make the hybrids that way with a real distinctive trait that the heirlooms have. So most of the really famous tomatoes are heirlooms. Now determined and indeterminate. Um, determined tomatoes are like um, pepper plants. And most farms that grow them in the fields use determinant. So what a determinant tomato does is it branches really like a bush. It makes a lot of branches. And all these branches uh, grow to a certain length. They all flower and fruit at the same time. And then the plant's pretty much done. So the, the, especially the tomatoes grown for ketchup or tomato sauce. So they grow them in the fields. All the plants ripen at the same time. They just go through with the machine and harvest the whole thing all at once. Most homeowners use indeterminate plants, which grow like a vine. So one stem, it can make more branches, but each branch acts like a vine where one by one, as, these, as this area gets older, it starts to bloom and make tomatoes. So here we'll have, say, here we'll have the flowers forming, and here are the fruits growing. 
and up here they're just starting their little buds. So as the plant grows, it makes continually makes flowers, and then the fruit ripens. So the bottom of the fruit's old, the bottom of the plant's older, the top is younger, and it keeps on growing. And then grow for years. If we don't have a bad frost, it can keep on going. So you pick from the bottom up, and that's most of the tomatoes we sell are indeterminate because they ha don't have a set lifespan. <clears throat> now it is true if you have determinant, um, you can get more than one crop off of it. So after this crop is done, they will grow and make another and do the same thing over again. Like if you grow peppers, you'll see that they grow one set of fruit, you harvest all that, we'll start growing and make another set that all ripens at the same time. Then it, it, it stops growing while it's making the second crop, pick it all, they continue growing, and make a third crop. So um, that's determined. So you can get more one crop, but most farms will just use this in the fields and then just take the one crop off and they're done. <clears throat> and that way with just the one crop, they don't have to watch for diseases so much. Whereas the indeterminates, the hothouse tomatoes are usually indeterminate. So if you grow them in a greenhouse, you grow those gourmet heirlooms, uh, you're totally protected from the climate and the weather. You, know, you tend not to get diseases. You go with the indeterminates and keep them going. Now there are also grafted tomatoes. <clears throat> Now we haven't sold these for quite a while. <clears throat> they tend to cost quite a bit, but they do have advantages. So in hothouses, about three quarters of them, I believe they said are grafted tomatoes. And the reason for that is they'll get, they'll find the plant, a tomato, a wild tomato that's the strongest plant they can find. Not necessarily make good fruit, but it's got really incredible roots that are highly disease resistant and they'll grow that um, for the rootstock and then they'll, and I think they usually grow them from seed and when it's a few inches tall they will take the, a, a stem of the plant that they want to make the fruit from and then attach it. It's really easy to graft tomatoes apparently, we don't do it, um, but it's supposed to be really easy, you just take you know, the seed you grew, cut off the top, take a stem that you just cut, put them together, wrap a little bit of plastic tubing. They have a little tubing that's just, you know, soft plastic. You can just wrap it around that and hold it together in a greenhouse for a while for a day or two and it connects and it's grafted. Uh, <clears throat> now, we've, we've worked with them in the past. Ten years ago, we had grafted tomatoes. And then the company decided they wouldn't sell the retail anymore. But now they are again. And we've got some ordered. I don't know what the retail will be on. I mean, it'll probably be over $10 uh, per plant. But we have seen what you can do with the graft, with how much stronger the plants are. So when we, like, let's take brandy wine. So brandy wine was the tomato that made heirlooms famous you know big giant tomatoes uh taste like tomato soup what can i say just creamy flavor just incredible but when i grow these plants it's like you get two or three fruit per plant <laughs> that's like that's about it um in our climate that's all we're getting two or three fruit per plants like you got this huge plant two or three wonderful fruit off it. When we got these as grafted tomatoes, they're making a dozen, way more than, than the non-grafted one does. So the grafted one makes some fruit better, makes them just stronger plants for any climate, apparently. So uh, we haven't received the baby plants yet. I think they're coming to us next week, but we've got to grow them for a few weeks before we can sell them. Uh, now, they didn't offer the brandy wine, they offered Berkeley tie-dye, which is an, a real unique striped uh, beefsteak type tomato, so we'll see how that does when it's uh, grafted. 
So that's the grafted tomatoes. So the hot houses, because they've got controlled environments, these plants can live for years. So they want to have the strongest plants they can, and the grafted tomatoes certainly make it worthwhile for them. Now, the reason that plants get old and get ugly uh, if we don't have a frost is that every plant we know of, they fill the ground around them with dead roots of themselves. And once there's a lot of dead tomato root around this plant, it just kills itself off. <clears throat> so that's why we, you know, don't grow them in the same spot every year because there's a bunch of dead tomato roots in there. Um, there are ways around that. So in some hot houses, they have a different system where they don't put them in pots. So most hot houses, they put them in a pot, not as big as this. I believe it's uh, they call the Dutch bucket. It's about 10, 10 by 10 by 12 inches high, which is a bigger than a number five pot, but not quite as big as a 15. And that's kind of universally used in the trade to grow hot house tomatoes. And they can live for several years in that. Now, the other method we, we've seen is that they'll use a gutter system. So they'll have suspended about seven foot off the floor of the greenhouse, a gutter filled with growing solution. And they'll have the tomato plant growing in this thing. <clears throat> and it just hangs down and makes fruit here. And what they'll do is every so often they will stick more of the stem into the gutter, cut off the end of it, it roots, makes new roots into the gutter, and they can keep that same plant growing in that gutter for years and years and years just by rerooting the same stem in it over and over and over. As it grows, they just stick more into the gutter, which is an interesting system. Now, the other growers grow up some pots on the ground <clears throat> and they found a unique solution um, and you can do this too but it's you know it is different so they grow them in these pots and they grow them and they have on the roof they've got a spool of twine that they'll attach the vine to as it grows. <clears throat> now, six months, eight months later, the thing has grown all the way to the top. So what they do, and say you've got ripe fruit down here <clears throat> and green fruit up here, and then, you know, the flowers and stuff going like, so once they pick these off they'll pick all the leaves off of that and lower the spool down and they'll start winding the stem of this plant on the floor around the bucket <clears throat> so they lower the string so they and this has no leaves on it they don't want any leaves down here so there's no chance of eating disease so they'll just wind this on the floor of the greenhouse for a few years as the plant's growing upwards and they'll try to keep the tomatoes in the right spot so that it's easy to pick <clears throat> now you can do that but it's much easier just to plant new plants than it is to do that so a friend of mine who used to grow <clears throat> he was at one time a commercial tomato grower and then he went to the nursery business he said he would just take a 15 gallon bucket with one stake in it and plant one tomato plant in that and just tie the plant up this eight foot stake. Now this is only a seven foot stake, but he would, this is an eight foot stake. So he'd use one stake in the bucket and tie the plant up that one stake and he wouldn't let it side branch. So <clears throat> in fact, most commercial, especially hothouse tomatoes, they don't let them side branch. Now most homeowners do. So you let them side branch and they'll fill this cage and overflow it. <clears throat> but the commercial growers do not want any side branching. And they have a reason for that. <clears throat> it's because in their hothouse, in, in the pots or in the field, some do uh, grow them in the ground in hothouses too. They'll plant their tomatoes 20, 
24 inches apart. And if they side branch, they'll shade the one next to them, which will render it non-productive. So they've already set these branches as close as they want them to be ideally together. So they cut off anything that grows off to the side. That's not the flowers and the fruit. You, you, you can figure that out after you grow them a few times. What is a branch and what is flowers and fruit coming out of that stem? And they just grow them as a single column straight up. So he, that's what he would do. He says every year at his nursery he would plant 400 of these buckets with an eight-foot stake in them and grow the tomatoes up there. He was our tomato expert. They offered uh, well over, well, he would usually go about 70 varieties every year. Right now we have about 70 varieties out there, but he would grow new ones every year to see what, what they would do and how they would be. Like, I can't remember more than like 20 of them. <laughs> like there's, but he knew them all by heart because he, every year he would grow them and eat them to see how good they were. And this is how he would do it. Every year it's the same, same method. And he would start, of course, with new soil every year too, but he had piles of soil, so it wasn't that expensive for him to do that. I don't know. I, I don't know his exact methods. Um, I know he used a wood stake, but that's, I don't know how he attached it. So. Right, if you don't, you know, if you let it, so if you let them have more than one stem, each stem is not quite as efficient because it's, you know, they're all shading each other, but it's easier. Well, it's, it may not be. I mean, you know, if you put up a single stem and then you just keep it trimmed, it's not that big a deal. You just work with one stem and you get a full crop on that one stem. But then you to get the same amount as you would off of that, you'd have to plant maybe two or three tomato plants. But each one will be more efficient. And if you don't have to buy a bucket, you do this in the ground. If we have customers who do this in the ground, they just allow one stem to grow up every two feet. Just spend, you know, a few dollars more on the tomato plants. Uh, you get more harvest per square foot doing it this way than you would that way. This is just simpler. I mean, my backyard, my wife just puts them in a cage and forgets about them for the rest of the year. <laughs> you know, that's pretty much it. So it's easier that way. This way you have to keep working, working at it. Not much, but you have to keep an eye on it. Okay, any questions on how to grow them? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a good question. So the question was, um, should you just plant it at this level or plant it deeper? Um, so about 25 years ago, uh, I think it was Sunset Magazine ran an article about the different ways to plant tomatoes, which would make, which made them grow better. And they said planting them deep didn't make them grow better. Um, scoring the root ball didn't make them grow better. The only thing that made them grow faster seemed to be to, uh, butterfly out the root ball. So that the roots are closer to the surface and not so deep going straight down. They said that made them grow a little faster. But if you, you know, so you can, they will root out of their stem, but that puts these roots deeper into the ground, which means that these roots may die because they're too deep and they'll have to grow a new set. So you're kind of wasting the energy now. If you use a better potting soil, because most potting soils, the problem with them is that they suffocate roots. So if they're too deep in the pot, it'll kill them. Our potting soil doesn't do that. So if you do plant them deeper in our potting soils, you may have the best results that way. Maybe some combination of soil, butterfly, and 
Yeah, I mean, the main thing with roots is the more oxygen you get to the roots, the more vigorous and healthy the roots are. So it's an oxygen thing. So if you plant them deeper and you don't have good potting soil, then they can't breathe. So you have to have the better potting soil at the same time. And then planting them deeper may make some sense. <clears throat> Okay, um, let's go over some of the varieties. So heirlooms are, excuse me, hybrids were first developed, apparently are first promoted um, by, I guess it was Burpee back in the 1940s. So they got a bunch of heirloom tomatoes together and created, I believe the first hybrid was this one called Big Boy. So that allowed people from all over the United States to grow tomatoes reliably because they had put together a bunch of genetics from a lot of heirloom tomatoes at the time to create this thing. And they kept the genealogy of it under lock and key until one of the hybridizers died, I guess, back in the 80s. And he finally told them what was, what was in Big, Big Boy. But, but they try to keep those things secret so they don't let them let you know. So this was one of the, well, the first hybrid tomato that was promoted uh, and still is being grown today. Uh, in the 70s, Better Boy came out, I believe Early Girl at the same time. And these are both uh, really good tomatoes. In fact, I believe Better Boy, not, um, not locally, but they said across especially the Midwest, and I'd say this is still the number one selling tomato. It's better boy. Early girl, I do like the flavor of this one quite a bit. It's got both uh, sweetness and some uh, tartness to it, whereas a lot of tomatoes you get this real mild flavor. Uh, early girl gives you a, a, a more of a punch to it. Now, they call it early grow because you can set tomatoes under cooler conditions. So uh, generally, um, tomatoes, when they bloom, the ideal conditions for making the flower become a viable fruit that develops is the temperatures. And usually you're wanting night, say night and day temperatures to be between 55 degrees and 85 degrees that's your temperature range for ideal uh, flowering and fruiting um, and that's usually we see this range March through June and then we see it again in the fall usually uh, October into November. In the summertime, if it gets much above 85, then it's they kind of shut down for a while. The fruit will still, that's already on there, will ripen, but they don't get any new crops going in the summer months. Now, last year we had a really cool year. It took a while for the tomatoes to start production, but we went well in the summer because summer was not hot. We didn't have any 100 degree weather last year, so. <clears throat> we had some really good crops. We had a lot of diseases too, unfortunately, um, and pest problems, but we had a good crop last year for most people. Some people failed, but <clears throat> the year before it was nasty because we had 100 degrees in April. That was really weird. And all summer, the two years ago was pretty warm, but uh, so right now, well, today the temperature is fine for setting fruit. Uh, normally not it, it doesn't happen usually this early so a lot of our customers like to plant tomatoes in january you know we can't get much in january but they like to plant them that early because they want their tomatoes to be five foot tall by the time this temperature occurs in march so they're all their plants are all full grown and ready to make fruit but um 
you're always taking a chance with the weather. If it rains on you real heavily for a few weeks, you can your tomatoes get all spotted up and you get messed up that way. So early girl, um, and then they came out in the, I think it was the late 70s, early 80s with Champion and Celebrity. And these are all still pretty popular. Now, Celebrity is a determinant tomato. It's one of the few that we sell. I don't know if I brought one. I don't think so. Now, Lemon Boy, I don't recall when Lemon Boy came out, but Lemon Boy, which is the big yellow tomato, is generally considered, well, I would say best producer. <laughs> Everyone who grows this one is just amazed what it can produce. I mean, one plant, you know, this big, you got like 50 or 60 tomatoes this size growing on that thing. It's just a crazy producer, Lemon Boy. Mild flavored, but everyone has the same opinion about it. It's the best producing tomato they've ever seen. Now in the 80s, Big Beef came out. And that is considered to be perfectly, genetically perfect. The, but it, it's a little strange looking. So the tomatoes, when it grows them, they look like red rubber balls. They don't look real. They're just too round and no imperfections on no, no ribbing, no cracking. It's just a perfect tomato and the plants are resistant to most of the diseases. So they can still consider big beef to be the genetically perfect tomato. Uh, it tastes pretty good. It's not great, but it's it's a great producer of uh, what look like perfect fruit. Our best seller is Momotaro. That was created in Japan. Quite a few tomatoes were created in Japan. Um, in the United States, Momotaro is known as uh, peach. Got another name in the U.S. Um, I don't recall what it is now. Hmm. But a lot of the famous tomatoes, like Sun Gold, were created in Japan too. Sun Gold is the most famous of the cherry tomatoes. But uh, Momotaro uh, is, to uh, when I eat them, very similar to Early Girl. I don't know if, if they're, they are the same, I don't know, but they're close. And they both have that, they're both this, um, about a six or seven ounce tomato, so not a huge tomato, but not a cherry tomato at all, uh, six or seven ounces. <clears throat> but they've got both the sweetness and the tartness that you like. So this really nice flavor on them. Our tomato expert used to tell us, you know, perfect balance of both sweetness and tartness. So Now, the company who made Momotaro has made Momotaro Gold, which is the yellow version of it, but they came out with a new one called Reika, which they say is the new improved Momotaro. I haven't eaten enough of them yet to tell you that that's better than Momotaro, but um, it's supposed to be the improved version of it, Reika. <clears throat> Hybrid. If it's got the Japanese tag on it, this is written in Jap Japanese, then it's the hybrid. Now and then, or in fact, a few weeks ago, we had the heirloom version because we couldn't get this one. And again, the heirloom one, sometimes they taste the same, sometimes they don't.
And then we did mention uh, Juliet is the original grape tomato. Now, since then, they've heirloomized Juliet to make cheaper grape tomatoes. But Juliet was the original one, and I do like that one a lot. It's, it's really a nice tomato. I brought one in here. Juliet. So the heirloom side became famous with brandy wine. But again, it's definitely not the greatest producer in the world. Although the there are different versions of brandy wine that are said to be better producers than the original kind of pinkish red one. We do have, I think, out there yellow brandy wine and black brandy wine. They said they're better producers, but I don't know how they compare taste-wise. I haven't grown all of those. And brandy wine does have what is called a potato leaf. So the leaves aren't divided like most tomatoes are. Divided into what that's uh, seven little leaflets. This one, just three or four bigger leaflets so it looks like a potato leaf now there are plants that are hybrids that both make potatoes and tomatoes i don't know if i trust those um so the one of the tastiest tomatoes ever grown is this one called black crim So from the Russian Russia area now tomatoes evolved they think on the west coast of South America um, perhaps Mexico but they you know it's been spread from prehistoric times throughout the west coast of North and South America but they think they originated in South America but a lot of the heirlooms come from all over the world now so black crim was the first real famous black tomato and the black tomatoes aren't really black they're the skin is kind of reddish but the flesh is deep green so when you see the green flesh through the red skin it makes the tomato look really kind of charcoal <laughs> dark let's put it that way they're dark uh, black cream is one of the ugliest tomatoes ever grown the the fruit comes out all cat faced you know it's got all these imperfections in it but i remember the year i grew it in my yard i had nine other tomato plants the birds went after that one that's the one they wanted they didn't want any of my other tomatoes they wanted black crim so i didn't get too many but boy that's a uh the black tomatoes in general have a smoky salty flavor so they're different than the reddish tomatoes they do have a unique flavor and black crim was one of the parents of big boy so the hybridizer said that they use black crim to get flavor into that big boy tomato now a number of years ago black from tula won a lot of taste tests. So black from Tula uh, shows a cat face fruit on it. Uh, is one of the top rated tomatoes taste wise with that smoky salty flavor. I mean a lot of tomatoes have just interesting stories behind them. So mortgage lifter um this was a guy it's also known as radiator charlie so uh it was a smart guy that didn't have any formal education that decided because um he he, he set up a repair shop next to a hill because the um the trucks hauling coal from the mines in virginia whatever country it was either virginia west virginia uh north Carolina, that area it might have been pennsylvania Anyway, he was in that area. They said they wouldn't make up the hill. Their radiators would just explode. 
So he would set up a radi he set up a radiator shop at the bottom of the hill. So he can make a lot of money. But he knew some guys from University of I think it was Pennsylvania. And he liked tomatoes, so he started breeding them. So he learned how to breed tomatoes. Uh, and they said he had German tomatoes and other tomatoes. And he needed to set them in a circle so they all interbred with each other. And then he selected offspring and he made one called Radiator Charity or Mortgage Lifter. This is back in the 1940s, early 50s. He was selling the plants for $5 a piece then, which is an incredible amount of money, but people were buying that from me. So it's called Mortgage Lifter because he bought a house from the, the proceeds of his tomato crop. You can't get houses pretty cheap in that area of the world. So anyway, that's an interesting story on that one. Um, here's Sun Gold. So Sun Gold is famous from Japan. So anyway, we have about 30 kinds of heirloom tomatoes out there. I mean, green zebra with stripes is interesting. Um, there's a lot of them out there.